Last week we looked at uh, some of the, the, the idea that there's next steps in our life, and every Christian has them, um, and uh, they're different for every one of us. And uh, today's sermon about sitting down, uh, it's a very odd title, but it reminded me of an experience I had in Chicago a few years ago. And uh, I asked my friends if they would take me to a restaurant that, that would give me the true Chicago experience. And I don't know, Sam, you're, you're from Chicago, so you know this town. You're leaning back happy. But, uh, so they took me to Ed DeBebic's Cafe. Now, uh, Ed DeBebic's Cafe was a big, boisterous place. And I walked in, and I was insulted from the minute I walked in the door. <laughs> it was, They would just ridicule me and say the rudest things. And, and I, I was there with my friends. We sat down, and the waitress came up chomping on gum. She sat next to me and started insulting me. Well, she tell you, and I start to order, and she tells me it's a stupid order, and all this stuff. And I, I just had never anything like it. And, and my friend leaned over and said, you wanted a Chicago experience. <laughs> You're getting it. And, uh, and at the end, the waitress came over, and she, was, she said, you know, you did really well here. And I said, well, you know, I, if I wanted to be treated this way, I would have gone to church. You know? <laughs> but, um, but the thing was, then she gave me a button. And I was looking for it today, but um, I think Damien borrowed it. So, uh, but the button said, sit down, eat, get out. <laughs> and that's their motto. And I, and I thought, okay. And so our, our sermon today is going to be dealing with the first part of that message about, about sitting down. And, um, you know, I, I really like looking through scriptures periodically. And uh, as a pastor, I guess I should like looking through scripture. And, uh, but I like getting ideas about leadership and things like that from uh, some of the characters in the Bible and see how they handle things and what happens in their lives. And uh, this week I was looking at, uh, at Moses, you know, one of the great characters really in history, one of the great leaders in history. And we always think of him at these big moments when, uh, you know, the burning bush and uh, the crossing the Red Sea and, and confronting Pharaoh, you know, all of these things where, where he was doing something big and dramatic. And, but um, today I want us to focus on a really small, uh, subtle um, lesson that I think may be more important than all the other ones, okay? And it's in um, Exodus chapter 2. And... Um, uh, starting in verse 11. Let me, let me read this uh, with you. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out uh, to where his own people were, and he watched them in their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in, in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you our ruler and judge over Saul? Aren't you, are you thinking of killing me like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, and Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. That's as far as I'm going right now. <laughs> The Lord teaches from this, teaches from Moses, from his life, and from how you want to uh, relate to each of us and to lead us forward. Amen. Now, you may think this is a very strange scripture, and that's okay. Uh, here you have a person who was uh, born in a time of uh, uh, genocide. Um, children had all, all the male children had been decreed to be killed, thrown in the, in the Nile and, and drowned. And uh, he was born into that context, uh, given up by his birth family uh, and adopted into the royal family, the Pharaoh's family, and uh, raised as an Egyptian, uh, as a ruler, um, greatest education, warrior, fighter, leader, had all of those trainings. And, and then um, comes out and sees one of his own birth people being mistreated, and he just loses it. You ever just lose it? You know, you just see something and you know this is wrong and some, somebody ought to do something, it might as well be me. And he kills the Egyptian 
And, you know, I used to think that this was a crime of passion. I was told that in Sunday school. You know, that way it kind of, it doesn't, it's not such a bad thing to kill an Egyptian. You know, unless if you're from Egypt, it probably is. But uh, the thing is, it, I, I thought, well, if it's a crime of passion, you know, he was caught up in the moment. And, but it's not. The Bible's very clear. He looked this way. And then it says he looked that way. And he figured out, nobody's going to see this. Now, he did that before he killed him. See? So he did this with forethought. And then he does a very stupid thing, and that is he buries him in the sand. Now, we have friends who were uh, missionaries in Egypt. And I asked, what's it like? And they said, well, it's an interesting thing because every afternoon, uh, the winds have blown in and our entire apartment is covered with dust, with sand. And we have to sweep out the sand every afternoon and then and scrape it off the tables and the counters and everything, clean the whole house, and the next afternoon, the wind's gonna blow and all the sand will come and cover it up. So, Moses, buries the Egyptian in the sand and in about 10 minutes the wind blows and guess what? He's just laying there. So Moses did think ahead in terms of the killing, thought he had a pretty good secret, but he was kind of dumb in how he buried him. Then he comes back thinking that no one knows his secret. No one knows he's a murderer. No one knows he lost it and uh, is confronted by now his own people saying, you're going to kill us too like he did the Egyptian, and he realizes he's been found out. Now there comes a time in every one of our lives when we are found out. It may happen this side of heaven and it may happen on the other side of heaven, it, you know, but it's gonna happen. And, and we live in the shadow of, wow, if they really knew, if they really knew, and uh, and that begins to eat on us. And, uh, and so now his own people hate him. Pharaoh's trying to kill him, it says. He's lost both families, his birth family and his adopted family. And all he can do is run. And so he runs. And he runs. And he goes to his outpost of Midian in the wilderness. And uh, it just says he, he went to the well and he just sat down. That was it. Now, so I've been thinking about this. Why is that in the Bible? Why is that important? Why is it that when you have nothing else left, when you're at the end of your rope, when you're at the end of your plans, when you're at the end of your ability to handle things, when you're at the ability that you're, you're at the end of being able to make it work, to solve the problem, to get to have it, when you get to the very end of it, what do we do? Well, if you're like me, you just keep on trying stuff in futility, you know? I, I'm at the end of my resources, so I'll just run on empty, you know? I'll just go, I'll just keep doing stuff that doesn't work, right? Uh, and, and this happens over and over in our lives and, and, uh, and we get burned out and in our burned out state, what do we do? Keep going. Keep trying to solve stuff. And I think that maybe for us, the message here today is maybe it's time for us to find a well and just sit down. Just sit down. Because I think in this moment, this is the hinge point on which Moses' entire life and ministry changed. It was at this point that he stopped trying to make it work. To stop trying to put together his history, his life, his adoption, his being sent away by his birth parents, his uh, struggle with his identity and his nationality and his royalty and all of those things with his own sin and his rage. He obviously has a little anger problem, you know, if you want to kill somebody um, made their little arguments seem bad, but um, it just stopped. Now, how do we ever know the living God and how do we ever get to the point where we trust God if we never stop long enough for him to find us. 
we find ways, if we're not physically running away, we're emotionally running away, we're building walls, we're hiding out, we're doing all these things. How does God get through to us and speak deeply into our lives if we're too busy? I, I noticed something this week. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be in a line at McDonald's or Dick's Burgers, <laughs> our sacred neighbor. Uh, we could be at Dick's Burgers or you could be anywhere at the bank and have you noticed how people like to line up and share with each other and they, they check in with each other's lives and they ask questions of the stranger in front have you noticed that <laughs> or you haven't noticed that <laughs> when you're in line at the starbucks and people are sort of visiting and chatting and check you you didn't notice that what are they doing texting ding, 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 ding. no they're pretending to text so nobody will talk to them you know, they're pretending. Oh, yeah, mm, boy, really, really, really. Yeah. They don't talk to each other. They don't even look up. That's how, we, that's how we've become. And sometimes I fake it, because you know, Aaron, I don't know how to text. So <laughs> I just kind of poke on the phone, and, and they leave me alone. You know, how good is that? But we never stop to notice. Now, last week, we talked about a word that was used in Proverbs 3 that... Uh, in all our ways, we're to acknowledge, acknowledge God, right? You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths, right? And the word acknowledge in Hebrew is, remember? Yada. Like yada, yada, yada. It means I know. I know, I know, I know, right? That word's used here. When we get to the end of... of uh, Exodus 2. It ends with God yadas the needs of his people. God does what he calls us to do in Proverbs. He tunes in. He pays attention. He recognizes. He acknowledges it, right? So, how does that happen if we just keep going? Physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, how, how does that happen? Where is the quiet part where God can speak into our lives if we don't just sit down? You know, Fulton Sheen, um, Charlotte gave me this book actually, uh, before her, her cancer treatment got uh, to where it is now. She gave me this book and said, this will really help you, John, way to inner peace. Now I usually don't trust people when they say this will really help you. <laughs> But I want to share something with you. This is what uh, Fulton, Bishop Fulton Sheen says. We live in the most talkative age in the history of the world. It would take 10 or 15 million people in previous ages to communicate to others the same information which one person today provides in a single broadcast. The love of noise and excitement in modern civilization is due in part to the fact that people are unhappy on the inside. Noise exteriorizes them, distracts them, and makes them forget their worries, at least for the moment. There's an unmistakable connection between an empty life and a hectic pace. You hear that? Let me say it again. There's an unmistakable connection between an empty life and a hectic pace. To make progress, the world must have action, but it must also know why it's acting. And that requires thought, contemplation, and silence. The world, he says, is in danger of becoming like a turnstile that's in everybody's way, but it stops nobody. Hectic pace, empty life, there's a connection. And so we've got to get to a place in our life, whether we're motivated by fear or anger or compassion or whatever, where we just stop and sit down and pay attention to what's around us. Now, Moses comes to this well and uh, he says, all it says is he's sitting, sitting at the well. Some people think that that meant he just showed up, had a drink of water and sat down and everything happened. I think he probably sat there for a long time. Days, maybe weeks. Sat there in the middle of town and just watched because he had nowhere else to go. He couldn't go back. What's to go forward to? Didn't know anyone, didn't know the customs, the land. he just stopped. 
and sat and observed. Now, I think I've told you about this. A few years ago, uh, I was in Kyrgyzstan with uh, Tim Halls, who was our missions pastor down in, in California. And uh, we were taken around Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan. We were taken around by a group of uh, uh, missionaries from Latin America. And so we would talk in Russian, Kazakh, English, and Spanish. I would sit and listen, you know. But those conversations were happening. I didn't even get the English in it. But um, the thing was, they would take it. And so I was asking them one day, you know, so what's your training? You know, do you go to language school? Do you have culture classes, you know, get, bridging the culture? Because they're, they're sent from Colombia and Argentina and different places. And uh, they said, no, our training is we're to go into town, into the city, and we're to go to the marketplace, the center of town, and we're, and we're to sit there. Until a shopkeeper comes up to us and says why we're there. And then we're to say, God has brought us to you. And then, because the shopkeeper is probably Muslim, he is obligated with a profound, holy vow to invite you into his home. You and your spouse and your kids, everybody comes and lives with them. He said, that was our orientation, that was our training. Because if God brings someone to you, what an honor that is. And so for the next six months or so, we would live with this family and we would play with their kids. Our kids would play and we would learn the customs and pretty soon we pretty well learned the language and the neighbors would come by and we'd interact with them. We were part of the community in six months. And I don't want to tell you that we visited a CRC a couple, a Christian Reformed Church couple from uh, Holland they had not left their condo on the fourth floor yet. And they had a language teacher come in three times a week for an hour to talk with them. But they, I said, have you gone down to the market? Well, no, we're going to wait until we're prolific with the language before we go there. They haven't left the house. And the people from Latin America are in the community instantly because they go to the marketplace and they sit down and they just observe it until someone comes up. And then it all changes. Now, I think that's what's happening here with, with Moses. He's sitting there. And uh, it says, uh, uh, seven sisters come with their, with their flocks. And it says they draw the water, they fill the troughs, they do all the work. And then they get driven away by other shepherds. While the other shepherds water their flock. I don't think that happened at one time. I think he watched that happen day after day. I think he sat there, he watched the sisters come, do all the work, pump the water, haul it, fill the troughs. Or, and just as they're about to let their flock feed, they're chased away. Until everybody else gets their work done, and then at the end of the day, the sisters can come back in with whatever's left after they've done all the work. And I think he watched that day after day. Now, the old Moses would have done what? Jumped up and just killed him. Boom, you know, Clint Eastwood him. That's what he lights the cigar, gets the shave, and then kills everyone in town. You know, that's what Moses would have done the old days. But now he's watched, and he just watches it and watches it until one day what happens. It, the Bible's really subtle about this. He got up. Let, let's look at what exactly what it says. Some shepherds come along, drove away, but Moses got up. And he came to their rescue and watered their flock. I don't know what he did. He just took care of it. He was an Egyptian, he was a soldier, he was trained, he was educated, and he just went, we're watering this flock now. And it's taken care of. Now I know that this had gone on for a long time because when they get home, the father said, wow, you're not late like you usually are. <laughs> you know, every day you come in, you know, hours later than this. What happened? Well, there was this Egyptian. And he stood up for us. Now, Moses' life changes from this point. He's brought over for dinner. He marries one of the daughters. He has a child, which he names illegal alien. Isn't that something? Foreigner. His, the name of his child was, I don't belong here. Isn't that something? Name your kid that, I don't belong here. Because he felt like, I don't belong here. 
but this is where God's brought me. And from that moment, he was never the same. Now, what would have happened if Moses would have just kept running? Past Midian, past more in the wilderness, crossed the borders, and what would have happened? He could have run his whole life. And we never would have heard of him. But he sat down. He just stopped and watched and tuned in and observed. And God got a hold of him in a profound way. Because unless we're somebody that will be willing to stop and let God speak into our life, how can God use us? Why would God trust all of his people coming out of bondage and across the wilderness and going to their home? Why would God trust them with someone who's too busy to pay attention? Lord, I'm going to get to you as soon as I finish my long-range plan. I'm trying to figure out what the difference between a purpose and a goal is. You know, Lord, I, I, never, I never could get that, you know. I thought, this is a word I've never used in a sermon. Ever in, I don't know, 35, 36 years. <laughs> I was nervous. <laughs> oh, I've used those words before. <laughs> Sabbath. I have never used that word, and I've always resented my friends who kind of harp on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sabbath day. Oh, yeah. I'm doing the Lord's work. Who needs a Sabbath? And I thought, you know, God, God said, John, you're going to say this word. In your sermon, rest. Just rest. It's not up to you. you know, and the things you're going through in your own life, and the people you love and what they're struggling with, I'm going to tell you right now, it is not up to you. What is up to you is to pay attention, to stop long enough, to Sabbath long enough, that God can speak in our life and show us what the next step is. Show us what, the, what he has for us. When that happens, I think we begin in all our ways to acknowledge him. And then he will direct our paths. I'm struck with this. Does this mean I'm going to have to try and practice a Sabbath? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm the preacher. I tell you all what is a very important. Oh, no. Now it's coming back on me. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's try that this week. Let's try sitting down. Literally. And figuratively. And say, Lord, help me see. Help me see with your eyes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that comes to us in surprising ways. Thank you for passages of scripture that we might easily just overlook, getting to the exciting stuff. But Lord, there's so much of life that we'll overlook. Unless you help us stop and sit and observe and see and tune in. So Lord, we, we've Put our life in your hands. Help us not miss what you have for us. That's our prayer today. That's our need in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.